So my name is Steve Hassan, and I'm here with Ronnie Ramos, and uh, I was involved with the Unification Church, better known as the Moonies, in the 70s. And uh, after two and a half years being a leader in the group, I dropped out of college, I quit my job, I donated my bank account, and recruiting lots of people into the group, I fell asleep at the wheel of a van and nearly died. My family did an intervention, and I came to understand that, in fact, brainwashing does exist, mind control, and have spent the last 36 years helping people get out of all kinds of destructive, controlling situations. Um, and Ronnie, why don't you uh, say a bit about yourself? <clears throat> My name is Ron Ramos. Um, I was formerly Missionary Ron from the Church of God. Um, I was uh, 12 years in that church, um, which... Um, has a lot of characteristics um, that uh, res rese uh, resembles a cult. Um, I'm not saying it is a cult, but it has a lot of characteristics of um, when I, you know, researched about cults through uh, freedom of mind and the bite model. Um, it kind of mirrors a lot of that. So that's why I'm here uh, discussing that today, too. Um, I've been out now for about a year. I got out at November of 2011. Um, I met up with Steve, and um, after speaking with Steve and looking on his website and doing some research on my own, um, I decided now is the time to um, help others also to understand what's going on in this uh, Church of God, this church um, that exists right now. Mm -hmm. And so the organization is the World Mission Society mm -hmm. Church of God, mm -hmm. not the Church of God. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about the leadership. Who, who, who's the big guy? In my group, it was uh, uh, a guy named Sun Myung Moon. This is a, a cover jacket of a book about Sun Myung Moon. And, and he's dressed up during one of the mass weddings where he would tell thousands of people, men and women, you're going to marry you, you're going to marry you and people would have five minutes to decide if they were going to marry each other. But, you know, since he was Father Moon, um, pe pretty much people did what they believed right. God wanted them to do. Um, and uh, so was it An Sung Hung who was yes. the analogous leader yes. of your group? Could you say a little bit about sure. it? Sure. Um, I apologize about the name, the Church of God. There's just been so many names to this church. It mm -hmm. was An Sung Hong Witnesses. Um, uh, you know, there's three or four different names. Um, but yeah, it is the World Mission Society Church of God. Um, their leader is An Sung Hong, who he died in 1985. Um, at first, we, you know, when we when I first came into the that church, um, I didn't know about Second Coming Christ. Uh, when we were baptized, we, we never learned about An Sang Hong. Uh, we just learned about the Passover. And then later on, after um, receiving X amount of studies, then we would hear that An Sang Hong, who established this church, is the Second Coming of Christ. Um, by then, it's you don't really question it because you think that everything else you heard made sense, so that must make sense, too. So can I interrupt <clears throat> sure. you, Ron, and just say that you're describing mm -hmm. a very systematic pattern right. of destructive cults, right. unlike legitimate religious groups uh, that are transparent and accountable and responsible and actually tell people up front who they are and what they believe and what to expect upon membership. Destructive organizations deliberately withhold information, distort information, uh, change information. And it's kind of, when I was in the Moonies, we were told, because the world is filled with Satan, you can't afford to tell people that Father is the Messiah. So you have to spoon feed them. And we were literally told you couldn't feed a, an infant steak. They would die on it. You have to feed them formula. And so we would think of the analogy that adults that we were recruiting trying to be fruitful mm -hmm. to bring them in were spiritual babies and therefore it was justified the ends justified the means to use deception mm -hmm. but in fact they're violating our religious freedom right. <laughs> and our civil rights to make an informed consent to to say you know yes we want to learn more about this group, yes, we want to know what we're getting baptized into, as opposed to a whole systematic influence or undue influence scheme right. where they break you down, they disorient you, 
through controlling people's behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions. I refer to it as the BITE model, which is, by the way, on my freedomofmind.com website or in my books. Uh, they deliberately break people down, disorient them, spoon-feed them incrementally what the teachings are, shape their behavior, control sleep, control diet, start to isolate people from family and friends who may be questioning, install phobias in people's minds to make them afraid that if they question the group or even have a negative thought, terrible things are going to happen to them. Literally, in my experience, the Exorcist movie came out in 1974, and I was bussed along with about 300 other Moonies to see the Exorcist. Then we went up to Tarrytown, where Father gave a lecture about how God had made the Exorcist movie, and this movie was a prophecy of what would happen <laughs> to us if we left the Unification Church. And I didn't know anything about phobias. I was a naive, intelligent college student who just wanted to serve God, just wanted to make the world a better place, mm -hmm. and yet they had shaped my identity, shaped my memories in such a complete way. It was, looking back on it, horrifying. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's interesting because um, the same, it mirrors that, Steve, actually, because we used to, um, I was told, um, whenever I had a question about something, I might have overheard a little something and I had a question and they'd always tell me, later we're gonna study about that. Later you'll understand that. Um, and it was so ironic because it's such a, a mind control and brainwashing that I was ac actually afterwards, I was actually using that same formula. I would tell new members, oh later you'll understand about that. And like Steve was saying, it's not transparent um, and it doesn't, um, it, it really does mirror um, uh, you know, the shadiness and um, misconception and deception, I should say. Um, so yeah, we had that same same mm -hmm. thing, and it was about the baby food, and they're not ready for it yet. Um, you know, they're not ready for steak. Give them the baby food. All the analogies that mm -hmm. we had. So, you, is it true <clears throat> that you were responsible for pretty much founding the LA? Oh yeah. Branch of yeah. this organization in yeah. the United States that you went to Korea mm -hmm. three times, I think you mm -hmm. said, with mother. Yeah. And you were regarded, highly <clears throat> regarded person who brought a lot of people into the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have um, some pictures. I'm going to go ahead and get them in a second for the sake of this video of the um, first church, which was in L.A. when they first came here. There was mm -hmm. a handful of us, maybe 12 to 14 people, maybe about seven or eight Koreans uh, members. Um, so that was the first church. There was no other churches in the United States, um, but now they're in Chicago. Um, you know, Hayward, um, San Francisco area, New York. So they've really spread really, really fast, which is alarming because um, they're really teaching about breaking up families. Um, they're, you know, it, I want to I just clarify something. Sometimes it's not what they said where they, you know, necessarily said to go break up a family. It's sometimes it's what they didn't say. Um, and I want to explain a little bit about that. Uh, for example, with abortions, I know that some pastors directly um, told members to have abortions. I, I was also told um, to go ask people to have abortions. Um, but sometimes for the members that weren't in a position like I was in as a missionary, um, and they didn't know about it, then they, it's, what, it's what people didn't say. When somebody was pregnant or had t said that they were pregnant, nobody in the church congratulated them. They were looked down upon. Um, it's a physical thing. Why, why if we're in the last days, why are you having a baby? Some, some people who are a little more aggressive would actually tell them, you know, why are you having children right now? Don't you know we're in the last day? So I know of many members who, um, who came out now and who didn't get to enjoy um, the birth of their children, they felt so uncomfortable mm -hmm. with having children in the church because it was really looked down upon. And, and Ron, because it was the last days, by the way, in my experience, 1977 was the last days, yeah. by yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, and what is it, 2013? Yeah. But in any case, yeah. uh, wasn't it true that your understanding when you were brought into the group in, what, 2000, mm -hmm. that 2012 would be the Ab end? Absolutely. I, I want to make this perfectly clear. I was taught a prophecy about 2012. I told my family my mother, my brothers, my sisters, um, when we uh, debated about the Bible and when they um, realized there was something wrong with the church that I was in, I told them that they need to believe in mother 
and that uh, the end is coming. When they asked me when, I told them 2012, according to the Bible prophecy. And they asked, my family told me, they said, what if we're here in 2013? Will you still feel the same way? Or will you change your mind about this church? I told them 100%, I guarantee we will not be here in 2013. Mm. So that's not something I came up with on my own. And also other members who came out who are not here right now will confirm that, that they also learned about 2012. So from okay. what I hear, the church is not... Uh, saying they said they're saying that they didn't say that but I'm here to tell you as a 12 year member I learned that in 2000 uh, 2001 2002 up until about 2007 when they stopped talking about that it was getting too close to 2012 mm -hmm. so, Ron, so Ronnie the what were some of the things that you eventually got disillusioned about because I remember we had a conversation where you were telling me about the Ham teaching mm -hmm. Shem Ham and oh, Japheth yeah. yes. and how the group looks down on uh, black people mm -hmm. people of color etc it was exactly the same as the Moonies mm -hmm. I might add mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit sure, about that sure. um, we also along with the 2012 prophecy in the early days we didn't have any um, black members at all uh, in the church. And we learned a prophecy about uh, Noah, Noah's three sons, uh, Shem, Ham, Jabeth, mm -hmm. um, and Ham, which, is with the, which was a descendant of Canaan, uh, represents the uh, African area, which represents the black people. That's how they referred to as black people. Shem was the Asians, and uh, Jabeth represents the Caucasians. Um, and they said directly that um, Canaan is cursed always which is why black people are cursed and they can never enter heaven. That's just something they they taught. So I Wait, don't, and yet they're recruiting people yeah. of color and Latinos yeah. and people don't realize that it's really a very bigoted sure. attitude sure. from the Koreans. Sure, and leadership. we were told actually um, pretty recently, uh, probably about two years before I left, we were all took, taken into a room and we were asked um, uh, not to preach to black members anymore. Um, that we need to preach to. They explained it as the last tribe, which is the tribe of Joseph. And they explained it that Joseph is a, um, he was the wealthy tribe because he went to Egypt and he became very wealthy. So we need to find the wealthy people. And they refer to the wealthy people as the Caucasians. Mm -hmm. So they said, we have to find Caucasians. Don't preach to blacks anymore. Don't preach to Mexicans or Hispanic. Mm -hmm. We need to find the Caucasians now and uh, bring them into the church. Interesting. Yeah. So tell me about some of the things you were told during your 12 years that you found out were lies mm -hmm. about the about the formation, for example, the beginning of the church. Oh, as far as preach, uh, baptizing and in the name, his son, <clears throat> right, and just right. whatever things that were important to you in right. your in your decision to, in, in your realization, this is not true. Right. This is not legitimate. Well, when I got baptized in, uh, in 2000, <clears throat> there was a lot of things that were not told to us. Uh, for example, we weren't told about Second Coming Christ, like I just mentioned. We were baptized and told to keep the Passover only until several months later, then we were told about Second Coming Christ. Um, the other things that we were never told that um, An Sang Hong um, had children. He had four children. Um, An Sang Hong, uh, he was supposedly... Uh, baptized in 1948, which we have confirmed that he was, uh, somewhat confirmed. Um, we don't have records from the Seventh-day Adventists. But we were told that after 1948, when he was baptized, he began preaching the New Covenant. Well, come to find out now, he was in the Seventh-day Adventist church for 14 years. So that's a, that's a big, you know, that was one of the big things for a lot of us members that came out because they said 37 years according to the prophecy. So they were linking prophecies with An Sang Hong's history but it's not true history. Hmm. So when you look at the 37 years, he didn't establish the church until his own church until 1964, which is 14 to 16 years after um, he was baptized. Hmm. So it didn't match up with the 37 years. Um, also, the other thing, he was married, and the woman who they call the mother, Zhang Jil Jia, she also has children. Um, they were both divorced from their previous wife and husband, and mm -hmm. I supposedly we're not sure if they married each other, but the church has a wedding picture of them in some wedding clothing. So, either they, it was uh, bigotry, I think you call it, where you bigamy, bigamy, or or they're 
were got divorced, which uh, seems to be against the Bible, especially for God to do, if they're God, you know, to to get a divorce and remarry someone else. Mm -hmm. um, Talk about because um, I've heard this repeatedly from people, uh, marriages being disrupted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I said once again, it's it's not so much what they said; it's what they didn't say. It was assumed that it, I just want to emphasize that this church became so paranoid. Um, when we had new people coming into service, especially over the especially over the last four years, when we had new people coming into service, people were told to go sit with them, keep an eye on them. Um, if members, uh, husbands or wives, were not strong believers, then they were um, kind of encouraged to not spend time with them, don't follow their way. So ultimately, it caused a lot of divorces, separations. And on several occasions, um, they were told directly. I was involved with one, um, I don't want to mention names, where I was told to go talk to the sister, or she was deaconess, about divorcing her husband directly. Mm -hmm. um, he was a bit of a troublemaker in the church. And a lot of times, you have to understand, um, I was a tool being used mm -hmm. because they don't, the, especially the Korean pastors, they don't like to say anything themselves. They just meet with one or one person at a time, and then tell them to go out and tell this one and that one. So, in, in my it's very view, deceptive. we were pawns <clears throat> yeah, of yeah. a Korean organization yeah. that had an, a covert agenda for power and money, yeah. and in some cases, uh, illicit sexual relations. All right, um, and that's one. Can I just say something? To you? Sure. That's one of my biggest things. Is that when I talk to uh, members who are still in the that the church now and tell them about things they all tell me oh i never was the pastor never told me that so he kept himself the pastors keep themselves clean by telling the leaders and then the leaders go out and tell them so when it comes uh back to them the american leaders yeah the american leaders when it comes back it's always the pastor is very clean of anything because he never actually told the members but he told the leaders Except what to say people like you are now coming out right and are to tell the truth of what really went on right you know? and is it is it safe to say that you feel some sense of burden that you've recruited so many people into oh, this yeah. organization. How do you feel towards the people who are still in and believing? Well, um, one one man in particular who I really um, love a lot, um, and he's still a member there. He's a good friend of mine. Um, I I remember telling him. I told many people um, that even if I leave the church, to stay with mother. Because that was my thinking at the time, that even if Satan causes me to fall away, make sure you stay with mother. So when I try to contact them now to tell them about all the factual evidence, they, uh, they, it's very difficult for them to listen because they remember my words of don't ever leave and stay. So I was directing them and I really, really, um, and a lot of people came in under me, to be honest. Um, uh, I could probably say over a hundred um, mm. came in under me and then whoever they brought. So. And I was taught to say the same thing to my spiritual children and to the people yeah. I recruited, that even if I leave, yeah. you need to be faithful. Yeah. And when I left and I tried to get them out and wake them up, they were like, but Steve, yeah. you've forgotten yeah. father's heart, yeah. father and mother's heart. Yeah. And father and mother are your true parents, and your parents are just your physical parents. Yeah. And, and, and fortunately, they've left now. All right. All but... Right. Uh, it's a burden still. Yeah. It's part of my motivation. Yeah, I agree. Say something about children. How are children regarded? Oh, my my um, my wife, she was the uh, principal of the, they call it the Sabbath school. Um, and she saw, I mean, she would report it to me. And, um, and personally, I've seen it, you know, three or four, five, six times um, when I was in the kids' room. We had a small sanctuary that's where the kids worshipped. Um, and I would go sit in there on occasion to kind of see how they're doing. Um, and the, you know, one-year-olds, you know, two-year-olds who were demanded to keep completely silent during service, which is unnatural for a child that age. Um, parents, I can tell you 100%, and I know ex members who are leaving this church um, who see this video, you will understand this. I know you will, especially if you've been there for a while and you've had a chance to see it, that parents felt so guilty and so um, the parents would feel so down because their child, they looked at their child mm -hmm. as being disruptive during service, even though it was very natural for a one-year-old to 
to you know move around a bit or you know to play with something on the desk but they were always shunned so much that their child is doing that disrupting father and mother's appointed time so i really feel bad for the parents but definitely the strictness on the children not only did the teach not only were the teachers very strict on them but i actually watched their own parents become even uh, so strict on them out of sheer disappointment that um, mm -hmm. that their child is is acting which you know normal but to them it was disrupting service yeah. um, so they the parents were learning from the teachers the teachers the the leaders in there were actually um, appointed supposedly appointed by uh, mother God so whatever they the parents saw them do whether it be hitting with on the ruler with the on the hand uh, making them stand up for the entire service or the older boys like around five or six they'd have them squat <clears throat> in a kind of a squatting position for about an hour um, bring them to a private room and <clears throat> you know just all kinds of things that they would uh, that they would do so the parents were learning that because they were appointed by mother this must be the correct way of disciplining mm. so it's and really it, took a burden on the kids and it's a pattern I've seen with lots of destructive groups like uh, the 12 tribes come to mind Jehovah's Witnesses come to mind Scientology comes to mind the Moonies the Unification yeah. Church my group kind of attitude, unnatural attitude towards children, mm -hmm. that they should be like adults mm -hmm. and they should be completely obedient and, and disciplined and shouldn't have fun and shouldn't have imagination, shouldn't have contact with, with people outside. Um, I just wanted to mention this is a literal copy of the Mooney Bible it's called The Divine Principle. This is my copy. Um, greater than the Old and New Testament, because it has all of the answers. I think I showed this picture of Moon at a mass wedding. This was a propaganda book that the Moonies put out recently. Moon passed away in September of 2012, but the group continues. And I just wanted to mention this book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, which was the book that helped me to understand what the eight criteria were of Robert J. Lifton, who was a military intelligence psychiatrist in the 50s for the Air Force, who was asked to study Chinese communist brainwashing techniques, so he wrote this book. And when I started studying the eight criteria, it was like, we did all those things. Yeah. And when I then met with Dr. Lifton, and I do have two interviews with Dr. Lifton on my Freedom of Mind website, uh, he basically said, you know, I just studied this secondhand, but you've lived it. They did it to you, and you did it to others, so you need to study psychology and explain it to people like me. And right. I knew it was going to lead to a life. I see you have a photo. Yeah. I'm going to block out one picture's name, but I just wanted to show this was me, um, I believe in 2004, with the so-called um, mother of the church, or God the mother. Or I just want to make it clear that she... She's, she doesn't proclaim herself as the mother of the church or someone taking care of the church or a motherly figure. Um, the church members believe that she is God herself, female God. Um, so I want everyone to hmm. kind of be aware. I, was, I went with, uh, saw her three times. Um, there was a lot of things that I saw that made me doubt. But of course, once you get back to the uh, states and you study more and you become indoctrinated more you just believe but um yeah this is the one that they say is the uh the mother so i am formally missionary ron so i just i want to let everyone know that um as of now i've become very free um not under the uh the strict regulations of preaching all the time and, and i'm encouraging other people to come out so that they can also live a live a good life a happy life without mm -hmm. all the um restrictions and fear factors of, um, you know, of worrying about uh, every day is going to be the last day. Right. And if the group is legitimate, it will stand up to scrutiny. And I believe that God wants us to use our free will. He wants us to use our minds to test what the truth is. And if something's legitimate, it will stand up to scrutiny. And I think you'll find that this group will not stand up to scrutiny. So uh, if you are watching this video and you're wondering, I'd say, you know, it's the beginning of the journey mm -hmm. to start testing reality. And was there another question you had? Yeah, Ronnie, you said you were in the church for 12 years. Why did you only reach the level of missionary and not pastor? 
Um, because in inside this uh, church, uh, particularly, um, the only members that were um, pastors they had to be Korean. Um, there was no American pastor.